The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Kind of fun and fun to be back in Charlotte. I grew up here. From when I was six to when I was 13, I lived in Shelby and Kings Mountain. And when I was a kid, the trips to Charlotte were a big deal. And I look it up online and discover it's a half hour drive. Did I-85 exist in the late 70s and early 80s? Maybe not. Anyway, I'm here to talk to you about how to get one of those awesome open source jobs. My name is Mark Atwood and I work for Hewlett Packard and I have a fancy title that I help make up myself. Um, I'm the Director of Open Source Engagement. I work with a group inside Hewlett Packard called the Open Source Programs Office. You can see here on the slide my email address. Um, I'm gonna make a point of that several times is it's very easy to find me online by, via my email address and I don't keep it hidden. Open, um, HP is involved with a bunch of different um, open source projects. We're heavily involved in the Linux Foundation and the Linux project in general. We're um, kind of famously very heavily involved right now in um, the OpenStack Cloud Computing Project and a bunch of other open source projects. I personally have been involved in open source um, since I first read Richard Stallman's manifesto in Dr. Dobbs, Dr. Dobbs Journal in the mid 80s. Does anyone else remember reading that? Anybody? Oh, my gray hairs. <laughs> Hewlett Packard is hiring. However, I cannot juice your application into the company. Happiness and success in jobs and careers are not guaranteed, nor are they specifically linked to each other. And this talk is a syllabus, not a textbook. I'm not going to teach you what you need to know. I'm going to tell you some of the things you need to go look up and learn yourself. And then the final proverb for this slide is life is what will happen while well, you make other plans, but make other plans anyway. The open source job, I love my job. It's kind of living the dream. And what's even better for me is it's not exclusive to me. Other people can live this dream too. First of all, it's a job. It pays a salary, there's a career, it pays my bills, it can support a family. It has hard work, it's got frustrations, there's corporate elements, people who do open source um, as sole proprietors or individually or as students or in a giant company like I am. You have to deal with all of that stuff. But you have to deal with it for a regular job anyway, and this is much better, I think, than most regular proprietary software jobs. There are a bunch of really awesome intangible benefits, and we keep selling this kind of job. Your skills will be in demand, and they'll be more portable. By portable, that means is you're working on a project that you enjoy with the people you enjoy and the technologies you um, decide to learn yourself it can last longer than any one company, any one tour of employment. You'll feel better about your work. You'll feel better about its impact on the world. And, you, and to repeat something I said before, you will be less subject to corporate whims. You'll be less subject to restructuring, layoffs, right-sizing, business failures. Um, for regular technology development and, tech and um, engineers, when your employer makes a business mistake or the market changes and your company makes a financial crater in the landscape, the executives and the salesmen can go exec and sell other things for the companies and you have to start from scratch. When you work in open source, when whoever is paying your paycheck changes, you can keep working on the same thing and they have to go restart from scratch. I, I, I love telling that to executives at proprietary software companies because they start getting really nervous. Um, the other thing awesome about this kind of job is it tends towards distributed work. Is working from home or even if you work from an office, you work in teams that are spread across the country and around the world. It means when you get involved in open source and you want to really get involved in um, high performance software development, you probably don't have to move to Atlanta or New York or San Francisco. They're awesome cities. This also makes it easier to move there if you want to, if you want to. So I'm gonna go over some of the skills you need to have to get this kind of job, to work in open source software development. 
The first one is your communication skills. You need to learn how to speak. You need to learn how to speak in meetings or at a table. You need to learn how to speak behind a podium like this. You need to learn how to speak when you're standing on a carpet in front of an executive's desk. You need to learn how to write. You've probably heard all this before and I'm just repeating it again. You have to be able to write clearly. The most important programming language you will ever learn is English. You have to be reachable. You have to have a public email address. Um, I've had some people ask me about this. It does not mean that you need to make, this, this goes back to the talk that we just heard. This does not mean that you need to have your life discoverable. You don't need to be able, don't need to have your kids' pictures available online, anything like that. You just need to be reachable by an email address that's easy to link to you. And finally, in communication skills, yes, a hand up. Mike, over to the hand. Um, when, you, uh, when you said writing, now just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. is that like, uh, like writing uh, company reports, or is that just uh, I generalized work-related writing? So when you say writing and speaking, how detailed is that supposed to go? Um, so the question was, is what kind of writing, what kind of speaking, is it just work-related? At the very least, it needs to be um, um, is um, business writing and business speaking. But beyond that as well, a lot of what's awesome and difficult to be an open source job is it blurs um, much of your personal life, hobby life, and business life together. So you have to be able to speak and write even when you're not at an office, not in a business setting. When you're writing blog entries, when you're talk communicating on social media, when you're writing documentation, when you're um, is any of those sorts of um, venues, whether at work or before you start working, you have to be able to speak and write clearly. And also between jobs as you move from employer to employer. It's also just a really good set of skills to have for, rec uh, for having an ordinary awesome life. <laughs> the final critical important point in communication skills, which I'm gonna repeat over and over again, is don't be a jerk. Your reputation is hard to change. And as was alluded to in the previous talk, the internet is kind of forever. The way you communicate online sticks around for a very long time. It's um, every time you write something, you kind of have to keep in mind someone's going to read this in 15 years when they decide whether they want to work with you or not. The technical skills you need are, are obviously important, but which ones are some, sometimes not as apparent? Um, probably most people here know how to program, but if you don't, I recommend you learn how. Um, if you want a basic, where, which ones do I start, um, which programming language do I start with, I recommend Python or JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is very definitely not my favorite programming language, but the thing is everywhere, and it's kind of, kind of hard to overcome that. Um, I've had some people ask me, say, um, I'm in a class right now and I'm ru learning Ruby, or I'm learning C Sharp, should I stop and go back and, um, and start taking Python classes? No. Just keep, um, it's, those are some suggestions, but Ruby and C Sharp are perfectly good things to start with as well. But don't start with those programming languages. Um, Scala, Erlang, AutoTool, C and C++, Golang. Um, learn a new programming language every six months to a year, um, just enough to play with it at least. Learn how to use a debugger. It's all the programmers I've met who know how to write code but don't know how to run a debugger. Um, you will spend more of your life writing so, um, in software development fixing bugs, your own bugs, and you'll be writing new green code. Learn, you learn, learn to use your debugger. Print statements are not a debugger, by the way. <laughs> nope. Learn how to use Git and GitHub. I'm being kind of um, specific there. Um, it's Git will not always be the um, distributed version control system of choice, but right now it is, and so it's the one you kind of have to learn. And GitHub is not necessarily the um, code repository for whatever project, co um, code repository hosting service it'll be for the, whatever projects you use, but it's the one that most of them use right now. Um, and by lo learn how to use them, there is both a um, technical and a social aspect to them. It's um, distributed source control is awesome and difficult because it's so much more than just check in, check out, merge. It's learn how to use the more advanced features so you can co-work with people, start pulling patches back and forth, merging projects together. Um, 
the more you learn about how these things work, the more blown away you will be, and the more, the more you'll wish we had these things in the 80s, 70s. The final one that's kind of weird here is learn how to write to test. This is kind of new. Um, design to test and use continuous integration. See if any of the projects you're involved in are using um, Jenkins, or if you're really lucky, Jenkins and Garrett together. Um, 15 years ago, lots, uh, most developers, only about half of developers not in commercial settings were using source control. Now nearly all of us are using source control. I would say right now less than a tenth of us in the open source world are using continuous integration, but that's changing quickly. Um, once you start using it, you will never want to write any of your own software without it again. It is really astounding. Probably not. Well, not to mention Travis with integration. That's true. Trav is, this point is Travis is also a good one. Um, I should probably accentuate Travis over um, Jenkins because um, Git and GitHub right now kind of encourage you to use um, Travis CI, whereas I came into the CI world using um, is um, Jenkins on the Drizzle project and now on OpenStack. But every, whichever one you use, Garrett or Jenkins, start using one and you'll be blown away how much better your code will get. Yes, question. Could you spell Garrett, please? Garrett, G-E-R-R-I-T. It's, um, it's an automated code review system developed by the Android project and is used by Google and now a bunch of other projects. Um, Garrett allows you to do distributed code reviews. You don't have to have your code reviewer sitting on the, um, sitting at the desk next to you. We all like playing with the computers, but it turns out there's all these cool, awesome people out there as well. Um, one of the things I love about working in open source is the relationships and the friendships um, and the um, adventures with my friends that I have had and with the friends that I have made. Um, you need to meet people, find local people, come to conferences like this if they're local, go to meetups, go to hacker spaces, find people in the schools. Also you need to find remote people to work with because being able to work remote is a skill you need and uh, there are more smart people in the rest of the world than there is in any one given city. Um, I give this talk in San Francisco and they just sometimes don't believe me, but that's San Francisco. <laughs> So, San Francisco. <laughs> to find remote people, again, conferences like this, um, the internet, we have built a $2 trillion machine out of a significant fraction of the world's gross planetary product so that we can talk to each other, just use it. Um, and then any of the projects you get involved in will probably have people spread around the world, learn how to work with them. Again, I'm gonna repeat, don't be a jerk. Don't burn bridges, the world is very small as you go through your career is, um, and as you've been going through your career, you're noticing you keep running into the same people over and over again. Um, there is a thesis that there are only 200 people in the world and the rest of them are um, non-player characters. Um, it's, it, and I think that's true, it's just that everyone disagrees on who the 200 are. So, but again, don't be a jerk. Don't be that guy that someone doesn't want to work with. Now here's the catch. You have to start doing the work before you get the job. You have to find the projects that interest you. You have to start getting involved in them. You have to demonstrate your credibility and your skills. And then the pain work will come to you. And the way you get involved is you find the projects that interest you. You start fixing bugs and merging them upstream. And you're doing this for a couple of different reasons. You're increasing your skill in that programming language, you're increasing your skill and knowledge of that project. Hopefully you picked a project that other people are using. Um, and you're also learning the development process for that project. Every project is a little bit different. One of the cool things that GitHub has done is, it, is in addition to providing um, a Git repository for everybody and everything, it has kind of a baked in development process. That, so lots of new projects use it. But not every project uses that and different projects have different ways of communicating with your peers, with pushing things upstream, with what's the right way to write a pull request, to learn the one for the project you're in. <coughs> Answer questions online. One of my favorite sites is Stack Overflow. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ask type sites. Ask.openstack.org was made up just for the OpenStack project. Get involved in those kind of Q&A sites 
start following questions and when you're, skill, you're comfortable in your skills and your knowledge, start answering questions. Take on larger and larger roles as your skills and your credibility grow. Collaboration tools, who uses IRC? Most of you, good. Other projects use other systems, but IRC is the default. Learn how to use IRC. Learn how to use your project's bug tracker. Learn how to collaborate with Git. That's repeating myself again. It's distributed source control as half technology and half social tools. And then another one that's kind of new to people is learn how to do strict code review and pair programming. If you are really smart, and if you've been a really good solo developer up to this point, this is going to be very uncomfortable, and you're not going to like it at all. Do it anyway. It's really amazing. For your reputation, you're doing two things. You're growing your skills, and you're showing that you have the skills that you have grown. The distinction here I like to draw is your portfolio versus your resume. Um, we all have a resume. We presumably all keep it reasonably up to date. But the resume is just something that you tell a prospective employer, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this. And they have to, um, they have to at least believe you enough to bring you in for a technical interview and maybe dive in. Whereas if you have a portfolio, if you have a list of projects on GitHub or on Launchpad or wherever, then employers can look at what you've done. It's artists and public speakers and performers and stuff. Um, and even um, professors and academics don't do resumes. They do portfolios or CVs. And it makes so much more sense for software developers as well to do portfolios instead of resumes. Your um, LinkedIn and your social media stuff. Um, lots of companies now, they look at your resume long, uh, just long enough to make sure it matches roughly up with your LinkedIn and your Zing profile, and they use that instead. This becomes less important when you're at the upper echelons, but when you're just starting out or a junior dev, um, you need to keep that stuff up to date. And again, have contact information on your resume and on your LinkedIn, how, to get, how a recruiter or an employer can get hold of you. This is all just background stuff, the things you need to get ready to get the job. How do you find the job opening? Nearly every um, successful project or growing project has at least one company attached to it. Either the company is shepherding it or the company is just hiring people who use, um, who know that project. So once you get involved in a project, you'll quickly learn which companies are attached to it. And you've also been making these friends and these peers and these working development relationships. Those peers will refer you when they know of an opening that opens up that matches your skills. And when you're involved in these, com in these communities and these projects, you will also be on the right mailing lists in the right social media forums. You will see the announcements there. And also you come to conferences like this and you come to talks like this that end with we're hiring. Now, the process of doing the interview and of evaluating the company, do you actually want to work here? Is the project actually good for you? That sort of thing. I'm not going to go through this here. That would be two long talks of their own. But once you've gone through the interviews, once you've decided you're going to take the job, congratulations, you've got the job. I'm going to talk now a little bit about some of the things immediately afterwards. Because in addition to get that awesome open source job, you want to have that awesome open source career. And so step one, counter offer. So who here has ever countered offered a job offer? Now, I'm seeing something really kind of amazing here. You, um, is, um, it's still highly gender-linked, but I actually saw a woman raise her hand. Congratulations. Um, I'm convinced that a not insignificant part of the wage gap between men and women is, is that women don't counter-offer their job offers. Once a company has given you a job offer, they've decided they want you, now you're dickering over price. And if you, um, even worst case, and you ask for 10% more and they say no, you're not out anything. But now they also have in their mind you may be worth 10% more. You have it in your mind you're worth 10% more or 15% more. Make that counter offer. If they don't want to give you more money, maybe you can ask for three weeks of vacation instead of two. Or you bake into your um, contract that you have a particular week off or that they're going to send you to so many conferences. Something. Another important thing to keep in mind, especially as an open source developer, is um, 
Your employment contract will probably have, um, I call it an Appendix B, though it moves around. It was an Appendix B when I got hired at MySQL. They're going to ask you to make a list of what your existing intellectual property. And these are project, these are the contributions you've already made to um, existing projects or projects that you've already started. You put that in there, um, sometimes it's called a carve out. And then you read really carefully through your employment contract who owns that stuff and who owns your contributions to it going forward. And this turns into what is the law in your state, what's the law in California, what's in the contract, but keep that stuff up to date and defend it. It's because again, you are not just getting an awesome open source job, you're getting an awesome open source career. And it's not much of your career if when you change jobs you have to leave everything behind. When you have that job and you're having that career, it is no fun if your health sucks. And we have the kind of job where it can really wreck our health in ways that we don't quite realize immediately. <sighs> Who can work an 80 hour work week indefinitely? Anybody, anyone? Nobody, nobody can. There are probably two people who can, but they start companies instead. Nobody can work 60 hours a week continuously without burning out. You can work 60 hours a week for about two weeks, then you have to stop. If you are working 80 hours a week and you have to work 80 hours a week, you are either in a pre-stage startup or you are in a war zone. And when that is happening, the number one job of your um, funder or your founder or your commanding officer is to get your workload down before you burn out. And if they're not doing it, it's your number one job to get your workload down because you will destroy your health working 80 hours a week. Who knows what Geek Neck is? That'll really suck after a couple of decades. Don't do that. Whose wrists hurt today? Anybody? Somebody? Surely somebody here's wrists hurt. They don't grow back. They don't. So watch your neck and watch your wrists. Who here likes junk food? Don't eat it. <laughs> Ever. Who here has heard of the quantified self movement? It's um, Fitbix, health, um, health trackers, that sort of thing. Write that down, start Googling it. I really recommend you get involved in quantified self. And the final point on health is jerks, again. But instead, don't be a jerk, don't work for a jerk. They're bad for your career, they're bad for your health. There's a cohort of technical executives out there who think that if they're a jerk, they're the next Steve Jobs, and they are not, they are just jerks. <laughs> Money, one of our favorite or least favorite topics. Who here is going to get a pension? <laughs> you work for the state or? Congratulations. <laughs> I'm trying to move them into an open source position. Yeah, I see. Yep, yep. Without leaving the career. Who here is going to be able to live off of their social security when they retire? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Max out your 401k and your IRA. Student loans, $120,000 is hard to pay off, even with a STEM degree. Um, borrow as little as you can, pay it off as fast as you can. Um, again, the counteroffer makes, um, goes a long way here. And then people sometimes ask me about options and stock grants and RSUs and ESPPs and all that stuff, and I am not a financial advisor. You should go find one as soon as you have a job where someone's offering you these things and talk to them about what you should do. But don't kill yourself for a nickel. A nickel is five hundredths of one percent of the company. That's a nickel. And there are people um, who will think you're there's giving you the world when they're giving you the nickel. Don't kill yourself for that. There are people in tech and tech startups in the technology industry who will strip mine you for your health and your skills and throw you away when they're done and they seem like the nicest people ever. But don't kill yourself for that. Smile all day. They'll smile all day and they'll make, you feel, they'll make you feel like the most important person in the world and they'll ask you about your kids and they'll sympathize with you when your wife is sick and they're strip mining you. So there's not too much of a startup scene here in Charlotte, but there are a few and 
And if you move to Atlanta or New York or San Francisco, that's all startup. If you do that, know what you're doing and what you're getting into. And again, take my warning about being stripped mind to heart. Do not take a pay cut unless you have real equity. And real equity, again, is not a nickel. And then finally, keep learning. Here's one of the things that is the most important thing that I wish I had known when I was much younger. Skilled beats smart. Skilled always beats smart. And you can get skilled and you can stay skilled. Schedule time in your career and your life for learning all those programming languages I mentioned or learning frameworks or learning um, new approaches or learning life hacking or learning quantified self or something, but keep learning. The tech always keeps changing. If you stop changing in 18 months, you're going to be completely out of date. But it's really kind of fun, isn't it? This is your life. And then there are three books which I recommend, which um, partially inform this talk and by themselves are just awesome on their own. You've probably heard of one or two. I recommend all three of them. Oh, The Places You'll Go by The Good Doctor, Getting Things Done, and finally, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by the um, guy who invented Dilbert. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Mark Atwood, mark.atwood at hp.com, and Hewlett Packard is hiring, and you can talk to me afterwards about the sort of things we're hiring for. Thank you again. Yes, question. Um, you talked about programming earlier, mm -hmm. and you talked about programming earlier, and I'm just wondering, from a beginner's perspective, uh, what what would you say is the greatest online tool? Not necessarily going to classes, but what is the greatest online tool for learning programming? Khan Academy. Khan Academy. It's um, there. There are probably other ones that are that that may be better, but the one that I'm the most familiar with that um, teaches basic programming to adults and um, young adults um, is the Khan Academy. They're, they're famous for teaching math, but they have an entire track for teaching programming in Python. It's, um, there are a bunch of other online resources, some better than others. Hit the internet and just sit and just type in the search learning Python and learning JavaScript, and it'll start giving you bunches of resources, but I would start with Khan. Any other questions? Yes, question. Uh, not so much a question as a comment. Uh, yes. Regarding the gentleman's question earlier about mm -hmm. the importance of writing, if you can tolerate a 120 second story. Sure. Um, I used to work for a company that used to be wonderful and powerful called Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, which became dog Funny, food. I, I worked for the same company. Well, there you go. Since that got bought by Compaq and Compaq got bought by Hewlett Packard. And that was a happy day when Compaq died. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Before my time. Um, while I was at DEC, I had one of those wonderful contracts that said that the dreams that came into my head at night while I was laying on my pillow belonged to the company. Um, yeah. That was the intellectual property uh, consideration. However, there was an interesting little loophole that said, but we like thought leaders, so if you go out and write and speak, we'll even give you a small incentive as a reward for getting something published. So when I got involved with open source, I couldn't actually write any software, but I could shoot my mouth off. And so I learned how to shoot my mouth off and how to write. And so I started, you know, writing things for Linux Gazette, the Linux Journal, a few other things. I uh, ended up writing a book while I was at Compaq. So, so it's, what is your name? Uh, Russ Pavlicek. I've read a bunch of your stuff. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, so I wrote all these things, and then the inevitable uh, in the post-digital Compaq acquisition, I got caught up inside the layoffs and thrown to the curb. So while I'm sitting there waiting to figure out what, I, what I'm going to do next, I got contacted by the publisher of InfoWorld saying, we've seen your writing and we're just losing our open source columnist. Would you like to be our open source columnist? And so that 
ended up being part of a career move, which was you know not in any cards I was holding. Life is what happens when you make other plans. And <laughs> so I ended up being a columnist at InfoWorld, a columnist at Processor Magazine. I did the Linux Show uh, webcast for those old enough to remember the Linux Show, and. You know, it sort of brought on an entirely different mode of operation for a few years until I got back into sort of hardcore software again. But when you're an open source guy or gal and you learn how to stand up and say something or write it down, the reach of that is tremendous. And you can't know where it's going to go, but it is a tremendous thing to do. So, you know, don't. You know, don't say, well, it's just a blog. Well, it may be just a blog, but that blog may open a door three years from now in a place that you've never even heard of. So just do it, do it well, and learn to do it, and other doors may open for you. They will. I have Linux Outlaws. Yeah. Did you ever hear of Linux Outlaws? Linux Outlaws, yes. Yeah. Fab, he, he started it, and it's working in the career for him, too, at uh, different so another plug I would like to make is um, for the um, women in the audience is the ADA Initiative. It's the ADA Initiative does um, outreach to women and also specifically on um, how to's and role plays and classes and training on how to do programming and how to do public speaking and how to engage in meetings and how to do the finances. So I recommend ADA Initiative to um, the women in the audience. And then the internet is full of resources. As I said um, earlier, this was just a syllabus, not a textbook. It's go and learn. Talk a question in the back. Um, I just had a short little comment, too, yes. that um, I'm one of the ones has an awesome open source job, but uh, I'm not a programmer. Mm -hmm. I, I do software support. But I, it's amazing how almost everything you said was rel relevant to my career field as well. Awesome. Yes, um, it is relevant, and I would actually rec it's um, one of the things I'd recommend is to make it a little bit more relevant. Is the projects that you are supporting, you should probably start learning the code bases for, so you can answer be um, answer questions and do support for it better. And that involves learning how to program in those languages. There's a question here. Uh, no, just a comment. I wanted to just say, for my career, the writing and the speaking went hand in hand. Yes. Because we had, um, in my group, have to write very clearly and um, approach technical people as well as executives. And not only when we write and do projects, we have to present them to executives yes. and others. So yes, uh, being it is being able to present important. is important. Yes. A a as I mentioned, one of the, one of the things, and it's um. Something I put in my notes at the last minute last night because I realized how important it is. There's a great number of my most important speaking engagements and um, writing projects are not in front of a big audience like this. It's when I have to stand in front of one executive's desk and make a presentation or a pitch or convince them of something. And that's also a skill you have to practice and you have to rehearse. Any other questions? All right, again, thank you very much for coming and enjoy the rest of self. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. 
The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.